Good evening, Bartley Church. Thank you so much for the joy and the privilege of speaking at your conference. You know, I, I like this new word that you just introduced to me, conference. Yep, and it's a COVID season that would actually uh, cause us to be able to develop new vocabulary like this. And thank you for the joy of speaking in your first conference. And tonight, I want to just begin by developing the theme verse that's been given to me out of the book of James chapter 2, Faith Without Works is dead. And I'm going to share with you something which I've entitled Developing Dynamic Faith. And I'll begin by reading for you James chapter 2 from verse 14 to verse 26 and then develop the theme uh, from there. So James chapter 2 verse 14 onwards. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scriptures was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Now, in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the, to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Lord, I pray this evening that you will anoint your servant so that I may unpack your word with clarity, simplicity, and authority. I pray that, Lord Jesus, this evening you will speak to each one of us so that we will all seek to develop faith that is authentic, faith that is dynamic. So we commit this time now to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The famous writer Sinclair Lewis was once giving an hour-long lecture to a group of college students who were preparing to become writers. So Lewis got up to the podium and he asked them this simple question, how many of you intend to be writers? And all the hands in the room went up, of course. And then Lewis went on to say, in that case, my advice to you is to go home and write. And with that, he stepped off the podium. It was the end of his speech. But I think he brought his point across. There's the difference between wishful thinking and true belief. See, if you are just wishful thinking, then we will not act on it. But if we are truly believing that we want to become whatever we want to become, then we will act on it. And the Apostle James in James chapter 2 is about to bring this same thought and apply it to the realm of our faith. See, and he began to expound the relationship between faith and works. And we're not talking here about the works of the law that the Apostle Paul preached against, but we're talking here about the works of faith that James is calling for. I think Billy Graham, the late evangelist, said it so beautifully. He said, there really is no conflict between faith and works. In the Christian life, they go together like inhaling and exhaling. Faith is taking the gospel in, works is taking the gospel out. And they are both necessary. Like Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 would say, But when without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. The kind of faith that we have towards God will then determine if we walk in true righteousness or not. So the question I have for all of us uh, this evening is this, what kind of faith do we have? The Apostle James from verse 14 to verse 26 of chapter 2 actually outlined for us three different, different kinds of faith. 
and it's good for us to just meditate on them. Now, there are three different kinds of faith that, that uh, James gave to us. Number one, he, I will call it date faith. You'll find this in verse 14 to verse 18. James tells us in no uncertain terms that the evidence is not found, the evidence of faith is not found in our words, but it is found in our actions. Take a look at James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Of course, that's a rhetorical question. Of course not. Now, James also gave us the simple example after that of someone who comes with a basic need of food and clothing. And all we do is to send them away with warm wishes and fervent prayers. So, I can, can I put it this way? We gave him a sermon where what he needed was a sandwich. You know, we gave him nice words when what he really needed was a warm coat. And he, he walks away from us still hungry and still cold. And James says, what good is that? Now, this illustration would really hit home with the Jewish believers that James is writing to because giving to the poor and needy was one of the primary ways in which the Jewish people, Jewish believers, would actually express their devotion to God. It was a very poignant example of faith that is not accompanied by action. And James calls it dead faith. You look at verse 17, he says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So that's dead faith. Now James is not saying here that faith died because of a lack of action. But rather, he's implying that the lack of action proved that your faith was never alive in the first place. Something that is dead, we all know, will not produce anything. But in the same way, if our faith is truly alive, then it will produce fruits of righteous action. And that is why James goes on in verse 18 to end up like this. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Now, he was referring to himself using the pronoun I. And he's talking about himself. So he goes on to say, now, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. That faith and action comes together. So if you have faith in Jesus Christ, and your life is really locked into that faith, you will end up doing good deeds. Okay, and here's the way we should view it. We are saved by faith alone, but this faith that we now have is evidenced by good works. So we are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. See, what, why am I saved for? It's for good works. Now, the Apostle Paul put it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. He says, But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgression, for it is by grace that you have been saved. See, so how, how are we saved? It's not by good works, but we are saved by the grace of God. Okay, through faith, by grace, we have been saved. But the key is this, saved for what? Ephesians 2, verse 10, Paul goes on to say this, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, if we claim to have faith, but there is no evidence of a changed life, then there is reason to question that faith. It's almost like saying, if you don't live it, then you don't really believe it. See, so faith without works is really dead. So that's the first, dead faith. And here's the second kind of faith that James talked about, deceptive faith. And you find this in verse 19. Listen to what James says here. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that, and they shudder. In other words, they tremble. You know, James actually go on to shock his hearers by pointing out that even demons can have a belief in God. Demons believe that Jesus is the Son of the, of the living God. They actually believe that. And they even believe in a literal hell. They even believe in the coming judgment. They all know that. But they not only believe it in their mind, but they actually felt it in their emotion. They believe it in their soul. And that's why they shudder in fear. They tremble in fear. But the question is this, does this belief save them? No. They persisted in their evil acts. They still go on doing wickedness. 
And James wanted us to know that we must not be deceived into thinking that if we believe the right doctrines, then we are alright. Such beliefs will not save us. They are deceptive faith. So faith at the end of the day is not just intellectual, it's not just emotional, but in the end it must be transformational, it must be authentic, it must be rooted in Christ. So number one, dead faith. Number two, deceptive faith. And here's the third, and most importantly for us to develop dynamic faith. And you find this uh, from verse 20 to verse 26. The Apostle James goes on now to prove to us that faith without deeds is useless. But putting by... How, how, how did he prove that? It's by putting flesh and bones to the concept of true faith. What's the best way to illustrate something? It is by putting flesh and bones to it, using a real-life example. So what James goes on to do was to give us two examples of faith in the Old Testament. And remember, James is writing to Jewish converts to Christianity. So he was using their heroes of faith in the Old Testament to illustrate that. He gave us two examples of faith in the Old Testament, namely Abraham and Rahab. So let's look at them one at a time. The first was Abraham. James chapter 2, verse 20 to 22. Listen to this. You foolish men, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous by what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. Now, uh, I, as you know, my favourite translation of the Bible to preach from is the NIV. Uh, however, in the NIV, I think that word complete, where it says your faith was made complete by what he did, that word complete can be a little bit misleading. Now, it does not mean that Abraham's faith was incomplete without actions to go along with it. Maybe a better translation would be the word fulfilled. You know, that, that, that our faith is fulfilled by what we did. Now, his inner faith was actually revealed by his outward obedience to God. See, and Abraham was a man that is right with God. And we all know that. He was a man right with God. In fact, God called Abraham a friend of God. He's his friend. Abraham did that not because he was good, not because he was religious, after all, we all know that Abraham lied about his wife Sarah, not just once, but twice. So he was definitely a, a man with clay feet. But yet God called him a friend and God called him the father of faith. Now question, how did Abraham become the man of faith, the father of faith? Now we all know the story of Abraham. He was already 18 years old when God first called him. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, it tells us this, By faith... Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he afterward would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So at the age of 80, God called Abraham out of the earth of Chaldees to go to the promised land. Now, you need to understand it was not easy for Abraham to leave the earth of Chaldees because uh, archaeologists have actually discovered that the earth of Chaldees was actually one of the most modern cities in the ancient world. When they excavated the Earth of Chaldees, they actually discovered they even have houses complete with central heating system and running water. It is like the metropolis of their time. You know, it would be equivalent to God asking you or me to leave comfortable Singapore to go to the jungles of Africa. And how many of you know that would take faith? It would take a, a deep trust in God to do that. And But one night uh, after... Abraham obeyed God and he left the earth of Chaldees and he was journeying towards the promised land. One night, he was inside a tent already in the promised land. He has arrived in the promised land. He was inside his tent, but he was feeling lonely. He was feeling childless. Why? Because God promised him that he would be the father of many nations, but it has not happened yet. He hasn't even had his firstborn. So Abraham began to seek God. And I want to bring you to that story in, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 to 6, and read that for you so that you could see where was Abraham's origin of faith, okay? So we go to the book of Genesis. I'll read for you verse 15, uh, the first few verses in verse 15. Listen to this. 
After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And the Lord said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. But Abram said to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. You see, during those days, if a, a person do not have their own children, they don't have their own son, then the, the chief servant of the house will actually end up inheriting uh, whatever the master had. And so he said, what can my, my estate, the person who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. And then the word of the Lord came to Abram, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And he took him outside, outside of the tent and then said to him, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Amen. So what happened was, Abraham was already in the promised land, but he still had no children. But yet God's promise to him was that he's going to be the father of many nations. How is that ever going to happen? And Abraham was beginning to feel uh, a sense of, um, uh, this is it's not happening. It's his faith was beginning to dwindle. And it was at this point, God again reaffirmed Abraham, no, your servant is not going to be your, your, your heir, but a son coming from you, your own flesh and blood, is going to become your heir. In other words, Abraham was prepared at that point to settle and said, well, if I'm not going to have a son, then my servant is going to have to inherit it. But even though Abraham was willing to settle for what's there, God says, no, I'm, I will not settle. What I promise, I will do. And the Lord said, a son coming from your own flesh and, and bones will be there, will, be, will inherit your estate. So what did God do then? God then took Abraham out of the tent, then told him to look up at the, at the sky. And it was in the, in the evening where the skies were full of stars. And then God said to Abraham, as many as there are stars in the sky or sand on the shore, so shall your descendants be. Now, what was God doing at that point? I think he was painting for Abraham a picture of faith. He was planting a vision into Abraham's heart. God was giving him something that he could hold on to in his spirit. And the Bible tells us that at that point, uh, in verse 6, if you read the next verse, in verse 6 it says, Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. And the Bible actually tells us, Abraham believed at that point. And then what happened at that moment was this, that God actually credited righteousness to him. Based on what? Based on faith. That very night, if I can put it this way, God wiped out the debit side of all that, uh, of his account and then credited righteousness to him. And, and understand, it was a gift. It was totally free. It is not by works at all, or else it would have become wages. But Abraham illustrated for us that faith can be credited to us as righteousness. So that was how Abraham became the man of faith. It was based on his ability to trust God for what God promised him. And then he went on in Genesis 22. Okay, a, a few... Yes, down the road, Abraham already received Isaac, the son. And then God began to test Abraham on Mount Moriah. He's, he asked Abraham now to sacrifice his heir, Isaac, back to him. And you find this in Genesis 22, verse 2. Listen to this. And God said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and then go to Moriah and offer him there, as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. Wow. You know, that was really a test of faith that Abraham was put through. And you know what kind of a test it was? I think it's a test of his, 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 his love, his, his faith, his hope. You know, it was total test. Take now your son. This was a son that, was, that he has received by faith from God. And when he finally arrived, now God is asking him to take this son and offer him back to the Lord. 
Then he will go on to say, notice what is, is written here in Genesis 22 too. Take now your son. That's the test of faith, right? Your only son, Isaac, whom you love. God is testing him. That would Abraham love Isaac more than God or would he love God more than Isaac? And then he says, go to the land of Moriah, offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. Now, understand that this is, uh, Isaac is the hope of the fulfillment. You see, it is true Isaac that he's going to become the father of many nations. And yet God is asking him, would you give me that hope? Is your hope now in Isaac or is your hope really in me? And God was putting Abraham to a total test of his faith, his, his love and his hope. And I want you to know, Abraham passed that test in flying colours. Then after God said that to him in Genesis 22 too, the Bible actually spared us the agony. But I'm sure Abraham must have gone through a struggle throughout the night, you know, wondering, God, how can you get me to sacrifice Isaac when all of my hope, my dreams, you know, my, my faith, is, everything is in him. And, and God must have, must have, must, I, I think Abraham must have really struggled with God. But the Bible didn't, didn't, didn't actually tell us that. All it says was the next morning, Abraham set up the donkey, took his son and they went. And it all seems so easy, but I'm sure Abraham would have struggled with God throughout the night. But the next morning, Abraham got up and he set out to do what God has asked him to. And I, I, I as a father, would ask myself, what would cause Abraham to do that? He must have struggled with God. How did he come to this place where he could actually carry out this act of sacrifice? I think Hebrews 11, verse 17 to 19, give us a clue to this. Let me read for you Hebrews 11, verse 17 to 19 now. By faith, when Abraham was tested, offered up Isaac, but he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall, shall be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. And then I begin to understand, why is it that Abraham could do this? It's because Abraham throughout the night must have struggled with God and he came to this point where he believed that God cannot be a liar. If God said that it was true Isaac, that he would become the father of many nations, and then it's the same God who asked him now to sacrifice his son to him, then guess what? God cannot lie. Then the, the only logical conclusion would be, after he sacrificed Isaac to God, God will raise him up from the dead. Wow. In other words, Abraham actually believed that God would raise Isaac back from the dead. And on that basis, father and son make their way to Mount Moriah. And we are told that Isaac carried his own wood just as Jesus carried his own cross. But Abraham's faith can be clearly seen in Genesis 22 verse 5 where it says, And Abraham said to his servant, when they reached the foot of Mount Moriah, Abraham said to his servant, You stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go there and worship, and we will come back to you. In other words, Abraham knew by faith that after they go there and he sacrificed Isaac, God will raise him up from the dead, and we will come back to you. See, and he absolutely believed by faith, Isaac will come back alive. And to me, that is awesome because up to that point in time, there has never been any record of anyone ever being resurrected from the dead. But Abraham, by faith, believed. So think about this. Abraham, he actually believed God for what? He actually believed God for two things. Supernatural birth, that a womb, now, Sarah's womb, which is a hundred years old and is already dead, could actually produce a son. But Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. So he believed God for a supernatural birth. And secondly, he believed God that God will raise Isaac from the dead, a supernatural resurrection. He believed God for a supernatural birth. He believed God for a supernatural resurrection. Compare that to us today. How did we come into faith in Christ? 
Isn't it also because we believe God for two things? We believe God for a virgin birth, that a virgin could actually give birth. It's a supernatural birth. And secondly, we believe that God raised Jesus back from the dead. That is supernatural resurrection. So Abraham and us, we are believing God for the same thing. And it was credited to us as righteousness. The only difference is that Abraham believed God for something that has never happened. Where he believed God for something in the future, whereas we are believing God for something that is in the past. We are believing God for what has already happened. And that is why he is the father and we are the sons. He is the father of faith. We are only sons of Abraham today. And because of this, we both now have dynamic faith. Dynamic faith. We believe in God for something impossible. The next person you see was Rahab. James chapter 1, verse 25. James go on to say this. In the same way, not, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? No, that's James chapter 2, verse 25. Rahab lived in Jericho and she was a prostitute. We all know that story. She has heard stories about the Israelites and their God, Yahweh, who had miraculously brought them out of Egypt. She also knew that they were conquering kingdoms after kingdoms and that they were coming for Jericho now. And in her heart, she believed. She had faith. But that faith was really made manifest when the spies visited her. That was when she stepped out in faith and obedient action. And she not only believed, but she acted on her faith. And the reward of her faith was that she entered the lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ. And James gave us Rahab as another example of faith accompanied by action. So these two Old Testament examples of dynamic faith, Abraham and Rahab. Now with all that as a backdrop, we now answer this question. So how do we develop dynamic faith? How do you develop dynamic faith? Here are a few things I want to leave with you. Number one is this. To develop dynamic faith, we must use our heart and not our head. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 to verse 10. The Apostle Paul wrote this. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So what does it mean to believe with our heart? When he says that it is with your heart that you believe, what does it mean to believe with our heart? Romans 2 verse 28 and 29 says, A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is a circumcision of the heart, okay, by the Spirit, not by the written code. Now, if you look at this verse carefully, it talks about uh, the inner man and then it talks about circumcision of the heart, which means this, that the heart is actually referring to our inner man, our innermost being. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, go on to say this, Instead, it should be that of your inner being, your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. So what is the inner man? In this verse, in 1 Peter 3 verse 4, it tells us the inner man is referring to the spirit. So in other words, the inner man is the spirit, the inner man is the heart, so the spirit is also referring, the heart is also referring to the spirit. In other words, when we say that we're believing in our heart, it means that we are believing in the spirit. See, many people claim to have faith in Jesus, faith in the Bible, but their faith is only in the realm of the mind. Then I would call it hate faith. That all we have is hate faith. But what we need is heart faith, a, a belief that is in the spirit, not just in our mind. You see, having hate faith is like having the Thomas kind of faith. You look at John chapter 20, verse 25. When Jesus, when when Thomas heard that Jesus have, have come back to life, uh, he first thing he said was, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands 
and put my finger where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. In other words, Thomas will only believe if his physical senses can rationalize it. So what's going on here? He's using head faith instead of heart faith. Head faith always said, I must see in order to believe. But heart faith say, I believe in order to see. Now you contrast that with the faith of Abraham. And then you see, is Abraham's faith a head faith or is it a heart faith? Now look, look at the faith of Abraham. It's described for us in Romans chapter 4, verse 18 to 21. Listen to this. Against all odds, Abraham in hope believed and became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said of him, so shall your offsprings be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That is heart faith. It is not based on what you see on the outside because the womb is already dead and Abraham was already old, but it is based on what God has promised. That is heart faith. God said it, I believe it, and so be it. Heart faith is... Uh, hate faith can be an intellectual acceptance of certain facts and doctrines, but heart faith takes you beyond acceptance into action. And that is why heart faith produces a definite change in people now. Okay, so use your heart, not your head when it comes to faith. Here's number two. Act on it, not sit on it. True faith is never passive, it is active. Faith will always move you into positive action. See, if you have faith, you will act on it. And that's why faith without works can be dead, you see. Um, I, I love this story that was told about four great men of God who died and went to heaven. Now, please understand, this is just a parable, but it's to bring a point across, okay? And imagine if you can, uh, this parable. Four great men of God died and went to heaven. One was Billy Graham, one was Reinhard Bonke, the other was Cho yong and then Pastor Tony. They all died and went to heaven. Now, unfortunately, they all arrived in heaven on a day when it was very, very crowded. And so they were all queuing up. There was a long line waiting to enter the pearly gates. Now the angel walked along and suddenly saw these four great men of God in the queue. So they felt that, oh, we shouldn't let these great men of God wait in line. So the angel walked up to them and said this, you know, you are all great men of God. We cannot keep you standing in line. So why don't we do this? We put you in a waiting room, okay, so that when the queue is cleared, we will call for you. And then you can sit and you just wait there. Now the only difficulty is that this waiting room is a little bit nearer to hell, so it can be a little bit warm. But you just wait there and then we'll call you when the crowd is cleared. So they all went down to this waiting room uh, and they, they just wait for their early processing, uh, for their processing to enter. But three days later, the, the devil sent a demon to heaven's gate to make an urgent request. And then when they, the demon went up to the angel and said to him, can you please quickly come and collect these four guys, you know, take them away because they are creating havoc in hell. See, that guy, Billy Graham, he's going around preaching the gospel to all my guys and getting them saved. Then this other German guy, Reinhard Bonke, he's laying hands on all the demons and getting them healed. This Korean guy, he's worse, this Cho yong fella, he's planting cell groups now all over hell. And the worst of all is this Pastor Tony fella, he's now going around trying to raise funds to aircon the place. You know? So what are these guys doing? They are just all just waiting, right? But the point is this, true faith is never passive. It is never passive. It is always active. So even while we are waiting, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are making things happen. We are, we are working. We are acting on it. You see, and, and I think that should be the way we view faith. You see, true faith always results in action. And we, are, we work from the place of rest, of, of in the waiting. And even the act of waiting itself, things happen. You see, faith must come together with action to be complete, to be fulfilled. There are many promises in the Bible and we wait upon God for them. But we will only access them if we act on what God has said. 
So listen to this. Active faith is the key to victorious Christian living. It's active faith. Faith that brings about action. See, and God is not moved by needs. I think God is moved by faith. And faith moves God, and then God moves mountains. And brothers and sisters, I believe God wants every one of us to develop dynamic faith. We turn away from dead faith. We reject deceptive faith, but we develop dynamic faith. James ended with this concluding statement in James 2, 26. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. If there is no breath in the body, we conclude that it is dead. In the same way, if there is no deeds, we can question if the faith is truly authentic. Genuine faith is always accompanied by good works. See, so do not accept counterfeit faith where there is no compassion, no conviction, no action, no confidence, no courage, but instead we make a new start in our Christian life to attempt great things for the, for the Lord who has done great things for us. So let me summarize it this way. And in the next few sessions, I'm going to apply that, especially to how we relate to this lost world. But here's the summary. Dead faith touches the mind. Deceptive faith touches the mind and the emotions and the heart. But dynamic faith touches the mind, the heart, and the will. See, and it always results in action. Our minds will understand what God is saying in His Word. Our emotion will respond uh, to, to His love and to His, His compassion. And our will then will be surrendered to His will. And we will end up doing what God says, and we we'll end up acting on what God says. Only then will our will true faith be birthed in our spirit, and this dynamic faith will bring forth the fruit of good works in our life. And brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is challenging us this evening to let our faith really bring forth the fruits of good works. See, faith and works. They are like two oars that we need, you know, to propel the boat forward. They are like two legs that we all have to bring us forward. They are like two wings we need in order to fly high. If faith is missing, there will be no works. But if works is missing, then there may be no faith. So let us believe God for a fresh impartation of dynamic faith this evening. We reject dead faith. We reject deceptive faith, but we want to develop dynamic faith. So may God help us to do that this evening. Let's cry out to God to impart to us a fresh dose of dynamic faith so that we can believe God for what He said and act on it. Amen. Let's bow and we have a word of prayer. Father, I ask this evening that Your Holy Spirit will come and You will speak to us. God, so often we read your word, but we never really act on it. And I pray this evening that you will come and impart to us dynamic faith so that we will take your word for what it is. And rather than to stand on our circumstances, rather than to stand on what we see on the outside, Lord, we stand like Abraham. We stand on what you promise us. And God, this evening there are many people here in this conference that really would need to act on their faith. There are people here who have come with their needs. They have come with, you know, with a need for a, for a touch of healing, of restoration. There are people here with circumstances and situations that are beyond their ability to control. But Lord, tonight we come believing that we serve a God who intervenes in our situation and our circumstances. So Holy Spirit, would you come? Bring this word, breathe it into our heart so that we will not just have hate faith, but we will have heart faith. God, we will not just be sitting on what we know, but we will be acting on what we already told us. And God, may you come and do that work in us so that God, we believe you tonight for fresh breakthroughs in our situation and our circumstances. So Holy Spirit, come and do that work right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.